This is a production of WKNO Memphis. Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. My guest today on Sports Files is former Major League pitcher Jim Abbott. The Memphis Tigers hoop season came to an end last weekend, and later on in the show, I'll give you some parting shots. But first, he's one of the most inspirational athletes of all time. Jim Abbott not only defied great odds to become a collegiate All-American, but astronomical ones to pitch in the big leagues and to do so with success. Recently, Jim paid a visit to Memphis, and I had a chance to sit down and talk with him about then and now. Jim, thank you so much for being with us. Really appreciate you being here. My pleasure. Let's talk about what you're doing now, and that's uh, motivational speeches around the country. And I'm sure when you started out, maybe it was something, eh, I'm not so sure if I want to do this, but it's really caught fire for you, and you're enjoying it. Well, I'm here for the big Boy Scout dinner tonight at the Peabody Hotel. And, and um, you know, I, I a lot of people know my story. I was born missing my right hand. Um, and, and I, I grew up learning to do things a little bit differently. And, and, I, and I, because of those differences, I turned to sports. You know, I wanted to be like everybody else. I wanted to be on a team. I wanted to fit in. Uh, baseball in particular was something that, that meant a lot to me. And I, and I ended up being pretty good at it. And uh, so I played for a while and, and um, ended up in the major leagues, played there for a while, and then finished up my career a little bit earlier than I wanted to. And, and some people came to me and said, Jim, you should tell your story. You know, you should... You should open up a little bit about how it was to grow up the way you did, how it was to learn to play baseball the way you did. And uh, so I've tried to do that over the past few years and, and it's going pretty well. I, you know, I just try to tell people, I try to express how much I believe is possible. Mm -hmm. You know, so many of the great things in my career uh, came after, you know, real disappointing low lights. There were these highlights right after these low lights. And, and so I just try to get people to believe in, in what, what is possible, what can happen. I also would imagine that you expressed that in your autobiography, which came out last April, the same sort of message and some great stories, I'm sure, along the way. Yeah, I mean, there was, there was so many great things. I was so lucky to experience, you know, so many things in the game of baseball. You know, whether it was Little League, high school, I played at the University of Michigan, which is a dream come true for me. I played on the United States teams. I was here in Millington, Tennessee for two summers uh, training for the Pan American team. We played on the Olympic team in 1988 had some great memories, some of the great baseball experiences of my life happened on those USA teams. And, and then I got to play in the major league. You know, I played in California with the Angels. I played on the East Coast with New York, played in Chicago with the White Sox and the Brewers in Milwaukee. So I got a chance to see baseball from so many different perspectives. And within that career, there were some great moments. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, you know, we won a gold medal with the 88 Olympic team and, you know, I won 18 games one year in the major leagues. Um, but there were great struggles too, and, and, and I, I, I lost 18 games one year in the major leagues. And, and so the book and my speaking in some ways is a try to, way to, to, to put all that together and say, okay, you know what, there were these great moments, there were these tough moments, but what did you learn? What did you take away from it? Let's go back to your days as a kid growing up in Michigan. How did you do this? How did you have the courage to go out there and you know how kids can be, and they can be pointing fingers and saying things. And how did you have that uh, that courage to do that, to be able to go out there and, and give it a shot and not worry about what other people thought? You know, I don't know that I always did have the courage. You know, I, um, I, I struggled. You know, I struggled with, with the hurtful things that are said on a playground. Um, you know, I was as susceptible or maybe more so as any kid to mm -hmm. hearing some of the things that you hear. But where I was lucky was I had great parents. You know, I had a great mom and dad um, who had a lot of courage, who had a lot of belief, who raised me instinctually and didn't shield me away from those experiences. You know, they, they knew that those were going to happen, whether you were one hand, two hand, whatever it was going to be. You know, you were going to come across some tough times, but the important thing was what were you going to take away from it? Could you bounce back from it? Were you, were you going to let those things take you down, or were you going to continue to get stronger by them? And so my courage comes from my parents mm -hmm. who will always be my heroes. 
you lean on your, your parents for everything, especially emotionally, as you said, your courage. From a physical standpoint of what you were able to do as a kid, learning how to play the game with one hand, who did you lean on for that? Well, you know, there were a lot of different there were a lot of different influences when I was growing up, and uh, I say to people all the time, I come from the great town of Flint, Michigan, <laughs> and, and I, it gets a chuckle because a lot of people know Flint's a tough town. It sure is. Um, but it's a great sports town, mm -hmm. and because of the difficulties, there's a lot of uh, avenues for kids to, you know, go to the gyms at night, get right. off the street, play basketball. So there's a lot of great coaches and a lot of great people who are really into sports. They're really into high school sports and, and little league, and so. There was always somebody there who was willing and, and optimistic enough to help me to learn to do things differently. Exactly like you said, the, you know, the creativity to learn to tie my shoes. You know, I didn't, I could. There was no paradigm to follow. Right. So my second grade teacher helped me with that, and and my dad helped me to learn to switch the glove on and off and hold the bat. And you know, I had a high school football coach who who made me play football, literally dragged me onto the varsity field and said, you're going to be our backup quarterback this year. And, and, you know, it was that kind of encouragement, that kind of creativity and belief that made all the difference in my life. Jim, when was the moment that you said to yourself, I could do this, there's no doubt in my mind, and the moment that you were accepted by your peers, friends of yours, not guys that weren't as friendly, and they said, wow, this, this kid's pretty good. You know, one of the big milestones in my life was playing here in Millington, Tennessee. USA and, Baseball. With USA Baseball. I, I, was, I played at the University of Michigan, and after my sophomore year, we had a, we had a good program. We were playing Division One, and I had done pretty well that year. Um, but I came down here to Millington, Tennessee, and, and we went over to those naval barracks, and the whole team was right. the USA Baseball tryout. And I looked around, and there was Frank Thomas and Greg Olson and all these great players from college baseball that I'd only heard about and read about and and when I went out there in the tryouts and did pretty well and made that team and competed with those guys for an entire summer that was the first time I really started to believe that I could be as good as anybody. Sullivan Award winner what was that like? Unreal you know I, I went to the Sullivan Award dinner and and you know the Sullivan Award was was supposed to be get to given out to, to good athletes. <laughs> the best <laughs> the, the amateur athlete. athletes. So that usually doesn't apply to, to uh, baseball pitchers. But uh, uh, yeah, I went to the dinner expecting nothing, sitting at the end of the dais. And when uh, uh, Florence Joyner-Kersey called my name, I couldn't believe it. You, um, you got picked in the first round around, what was it, seventh or eighth by the eighth. Angels? Mm -hmm. I mean, did that just blow your mind? Yeah, it did. It did in some ways. Um, Coming from Flint, the Tigers had always kind of been who I looked up to. They were sort of baseball, Major League Baseball, and the Angels drafted me. This, you know, this team I didn't know a whole lot about out on the West Coast, and uh, they had told me they were going to draft me. I, I had talked to them before, but until you actually get that phone call in the morning, it, you know, I, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to get that chance. I'm going to get the chance that I knew my friend Tino Martinez was going to get, mm -hmm. Andy Bennis was going to get, and, and 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 you know, it was an exciting time. Jim, a terrific career in Major League Baseball. You threw the no-hitter with New York. You won a lot of games. Why so successful? <laughs> you know, I, I, had, I, was, I was fortunate to have a good left arm. I, I had good stuff when I was younger. I, I really, uh, you know, I had a good moving fastball on the inside, point, inside part of the fa uh, plate and, and a slider and a curveball. I had some great coaching. And, and um, that was a fun year. That was, that was a fun year. And, and, it's rare that you get to any point in your life um, where you step into it and you know, I got this. You know, I, I know what I need to do and I can do it against the very best there is. And there were a few games that year where I felt like that and it was a wonderful feeling. I remember watching you pitch so many times and having to switch the glove, which is an amazing feat in itself. But you're talking about big league players and these hitters that are ferocious. Did you ever have... Uh, how many times were you hit with a comeback, or were you, and were there ever really close calls because you got that extra timing to have to put the glove on the other hand? You know, if they hit it hard enough, I ducked like everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I did get hit hard one time. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I had various ground balls and different things that hit sure. me in the shins, and those right. were more painful than they look. But uh, Frank Thomas, who was my teammate here, I keep talking about the USA team, just maybe just because I'm thinking about it so much, but... 
Frank Thomas, who was a teammate on the Pan Am team, I faced him uh, when I was with the Yankees and he was with the White Sox. And he hit a fastball. I, li I literally, I heard it, but I never saw it. And it hit me right in the leg. Wow. And um, I was lucky that where it hit me, it didn't break anything. I, I had bad bruise. I stayed in the game, and he teased me a little bit about how hard he hit it and everything. But uh, uh, I was very lucky. You know, it, it, there's some balls I don't care, one hand, two hands. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's just so little time to react. You mentioned the Yankees, perfect segue. You throw a no-no in the pinstripes for the Bronx Bombers. Is that the highlight of the major league career, I would imagine? Yeah, in some ways. For one game, it, you know, it's um, another one of those. I, I sort of dislike the, the, the adjective unreal because it, it's sort of, you know, you hear it so much. But it really was. But it was real. It was hard. <laughs> it, but, but the feeling was so unreal. You know, mm -hmm. it was, you get that last out and, and the momentum builds in a no-hitter. And, and um, the, the Yankee fans, the fact that it happened in Yankee Stadium is, is um, I know there's a lot of people who don't like the Yankees, a lot of people who do like them, but to have something happen in that stadium, it, it just seems momentous. Every out, you know, there was this countdown, and people were literally jumping up and down in the stands and, and, and cheering on every strike and booing on every ball, and every out there was more momentum going towards the end. And to get that countdown going and to get that last out, it's, you just look around Yankee Stadium and you think, man, how does this happen? You what, do you, what do you remember the most? Who was the first one to, to mob you? I remember uh, it was a ground ball to shortstop. Um, Randy Velarde was our shortstop, mm -hmm. and he threw it across the diamond to one of my favorite teammates, Donnie Mattingly. And Donnie threw his hands in the air, and, and, and it was my first year with the Yankees, and so Donnie was the captain. You know, Donnie was sure. Yankee baseball personified at that point. And when I saw him throw his hands in the air, and to see his excitement, and I turned towards the catcher that day, Matt Noakes, who, you know, of course, was there for every pitch, and, and, and those two guys I remember the most. After you retired a decade in Major League Baseball, accomplishing what you did, and now you're married and kicking back a little bit and relaxing, did you ever have any, you always hear with professional athletes, oh, they go through with, withdrawal. They need that uh, competition. Did you ever have that, or were you fine? Hey. What I did um, was pretty amazing, and I'm happy with it. I'm ready to move on to the next phase of my life. You know, I had that. I, st I struggled. Every I think everybody does a little bit. Um, not many people can be Cal Ripken or George Brett, or, you know, a guy who just walks away having done everything and right. straight to the Hall of Fame, played with one team and all that. And um, I did it backwards in my career. I went directly to the major leagues in the beginning, and I, I served some time in the minor leagues mm -hmm. later on. And... I actually was released by the Angels, and, and I went through this long comeback with the White Sox through the minor leagues. And um, In some ways, although I didn't play baseball very much longer after that experience, in some ways to go back to the minor leagues and pitch in those ballparks and see baseball sort of for the love of it again Interesting. allowed me to move on with my life and say, I've done everything I possibly could to, to play as long and as hard as I could. I'm proud of it. And I'm ready to move on, and and um, I miss it like everybody does. But I don't. It's not debilitating. Right. What's pretty amazing is you played for four teams, but you played for two of them twice. I had a lot of friends in the game. <laughs> <laughs> they wanted you back, Jim. Yeah, I know. I had friends who believed in me, and in um, you know when were rooting for me and gave me opportunities. So I'm thankful for that. Jim, for a youngster who has a handicap or a disability, they want to follow in the footsteps of a Jim Abbott or somebody else who has been able to accomplish what you have accomplished. What would be your, your few words or a few sentences for them, uh, words to, to live by, to try to accomplish those goals? I think, I, I think back to my own parents um, when somebody asked me that question. My parents had me at a very early age and there was a lot of uncertainty in their life when they had me. Mm -hmm. and. I think about those struggles, you know, I think about where our family was and, 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 and just which direction things would go, really, in a lot of different ways, a lot of different levels. But the one gift my parents gave me through all that uncertainty was the idea that I was up to the challenge, you know, that, that in some ways my hand was something to be lived up to, mm -hmm. that it was a challenge that I could handle, that I had the other intangibles to deal with it, 
in, in, in that it was something that I could use to, to move me forward. And if I could pass a message on to any young kid, or really anybody, it's that we are up to the challenge. You know, we, we don't want it. Challenge scares us, but in a lot of times it, it pushes us forward. Well said. Final thing, this is called Five for the Road. So just quick answers, whatever comes to your mind, and we'll wrap things up. What is your favorite sports team of all time, but you can't choose any of the teams you played for, Jim? So, and it doesn't have to be baseball. No question. University of Michigan football. Big blue. The Wolverines. But that's not professional. That's collegiate. Oh, that's professional. Yeah. Who do you go uh, prof uh, professional? Quickly, professional uh, California Angels. Um, it used to be. Now they're the Okay, I'll, 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 I'll just slide <laughs> on that I'll one. Over. Myself. Um, favorite athlete? Maybe growing up, who was who did you idolize? I idolized Alan Trammell, the shortstop for the Detroit Tigers. Sure. I idolized uh, the quarterback from the University of Michigan when I was growing up, a guy named Rick Leach from my hometown, Flint, Michigan. Who ended up playing baseball, right? He played With professional Detroit. baseball for a few years and played on the Tigers and, and uh, was a big motivator for me and a, and a good friend. Favorite music, musician, group, who do you like to listen to? I love Neil Young and Wilco. I, saw, I watched Neil Young documentary the other night on, I think right? it was HBO Showtime, whatever it was. Favorite movie of all time? Godfather. One? And two. And two. Three and didn't th happen. <laughs> <laughs> Should have cut it at two. And finally, your favorite television series of all time? My favorite television series of all time? Uh, I really, really like The Sopranos. Pretty good series. Yeah, it's a good series. Single digit handicap in the game of golf. Man, oh man. You would spank me out there, man. Hit them well, hit them long, <laughs> hit them straight. Best of luck with everything, uh, with the family. I know you got a couple of young girls that are growing up very fast. Jim, an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for being with us. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks. One of the many things I've learned over the course of my 30 years in sports casting is don't be too surprised by anything you see. From boxing to MMA, women have made a mark for themselves. And here in Memphis, some ambitious women are competing at a high level in the sport of rugby. The Memphis women's rugby team has been going strong since 2004. These ladies work full-time jobs, go to school, some even have families. But twice a week they hit Toby Field for practice and gather on Saturdays for games. Captain Cheryl Colson is one of those ambitious women I speak of. Cheryl, it's cold outside, it's wet. What the heck's going through your mind? Why are you doing this? Um, well, I, I love rugby. Uh, rugby's something that I've been a part of for a long time in my life. Um, I, I love uh, playing the sport and being with the girls, uh, the camaraderie on the team. Um, and I like hitting people. And hey, when the ground's wet, it's softer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was asking some of the, uh, your teammates, is it the competition? Is it the great workout you get? And they said it's really all of the above, but a lot of you played in high school. You, you played at Southern Illinois. It was a club sport then. So I guess that competitive, the competitive juices are still flowing. You guys want to continue to compete? Correct, yep. Um, and I, I played sports in high school as well. In high school, I played um, basketball and volleyball and ran track and played summer softball. So I've always been an athlete. And when I got to college, to be able to find a sport where, that was practicing, you know, four times a week and playing games on the weekends uh, and, and competitive, you know, it wasn't intramural. It was, it was a competitive sport playing against other teams and, and to be able to continue doing that as an adult has been great but too. But not as much contact in those other sports. No, it's not. A little bit different. <laughs> so you came here in, in 05. This team was founded in 04. So you've pretty much been with them for the whole time period they've been in, ex in existence. Correct. Um, Highs, lows, ups and downs, financially I'm sure it's tough sometimes to, yes. to fund the team. Tell me a little bit about this organization. Um, I think one of the, the things for me that I've seen grow is when I first started playing for the team. I'd played in college before um, and when I went to our first game with uh, the team, they weren't very good. The, the Memphis right. team wasn't very good and I realized I was going to have to step up and uh, use my knowledge and skills to help these girls become better. And over the years, I mean, it's just been tremendous growth on the team. Um, actually, last in 2011, we went to the national championships um, in Virginia Beach, which was pretty awesome. So You're the biggest women's rugby team in the state of Tennessee. Yes. And they have teams all over the place. Yes. Um, 
we, now Memphis has always had their own team and for years Chattanooga, Nashville, and Knoxville had to combine to make their own team wow. out of three different cities. But we've been able to steadily recruit. You know, we have people who move away, people who retire, they get too old, I guess. <laughs> you know, and people who just move on from rugby, but we've been able to steadily recruit and always have our own team here in Memphis. Um, unlike Nashville, Knoxville, um, Chattanooga, they all had to combine. They, they're finally breaking off now. Um, and Nashville and Knoxville have their own teams. And Chattanooga is joining in where they fit in with those two teams. We're here at Toby Field and you're practicing and you're going to play a game here, but you also play at USA Stadium. So Correct. For the folks out there who right now it's piquing their interest, they say, wait a minute, I, I, we, we didn't even know this existed. Tell them a little bit about where to go, when you practice, when the games are. Okay, yeah, we practice twice a week. We practice every Monday and Thursday here at Toby Park. Um, we practice from 6.30 to 8.30. Um, and then our games are always on Saturdays. If they're a home game, they're usually at USA Stadium um, in Millington because um, we get to play with other teams. The high school teams are out there playing and the men's teams are out there playing. And to have rugby all in one central location um, gets us more people out there to watch too. For those who don't know the sport, uh, describe the sport and then just briefly how it works okay. once the game starts. Um, so one of my favorite quotes that they use on one of their first flyers uh, to recruit people for rugby in Memphis was, it's like a sorority, but you get to hit people. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, that's what, that, that kind of defines rugby. It's got that camaraderie, like I was telling you earlier, these girls are my family. Um, and uh, rugby is, is a contact sport. It's full contact sport with, with no pads, no helmet. Um, you got your cleats and a mouth guard is what you're out there with. Um, you got 15 girls on each team on the field at a time. And the girls range from really small girls to really big girls. And, and we're looking for girls of all different sizes to come out and play. We're always recruiting, wanting new players. And if you don't know anything, that's okay. You know, we'll teach you everything you need to know. Um, when I first came out in college, I didn't know anything about rugby. I, uh, I learned everything from the girls that were out there. I'd never seen a game, I'd never mm -hmm. played a game, but I practiced with them for three weeks and got out there and played and it was awesome. Do you have a website or how can a young lady who's interested get in contact with you? Um, we do have a website, it's memphiswomensrugby.com and that's gonna have all of our contact information, um, you know, uh, email addresses and that kind of things to get a hold of us. Um, and then uh, we're also on Facebook. There's a, we have a Facebook page, um, Memphis Women's Rugby as well on there. Um, and yeah, look up the emails. There's gonna be an email for me. I'm the captain of the team. It's gonna list my name um, with my email address and you can just click on it and shoot me an email and I'll give you all the details you need to know. All right, you've mentioned contact and hitting at least three times during this interview. <laughs> Here's the thing though. Football, pads, boxing, sometimes, well, at least amateur, you have the helmets, not professional, but there's no padding here. You're, so obviously, there's going to be a lot of injuries. You suffered one last year. Pretty, pretty bad, and you come right back. Tell everybody about that. Uh, I did. I last year um, on March 31st of last year, I tore my ACL, and um, I had reconstruction surgery, and I was able to come back uh, after good physical therapy. Um, I was able to come back six months after, and, and I'm back playing again, which which feels great. I'm glad to be back out on the field. It says an awful lot about you, and obviously rehabilitation, but also the great athlete you are. I mean, you talk about a workout. This is a workout, right? Oh yeah, definitely. And and uh, you know, not are we only out here two times a week w working out with each other, but I'm always encouraging the girls to do things on their own. You know, go running. You know, do a Zumba class. You know, uh, lift weights. Whatever you need to do to work out in your free time, because we I need you to practice your skills out here. And so I, I really need you to do your workout on your own as well, so that when it comes to game day, we're all on the same page. You've won a lot of trophies for winning different tournaments. You mentioned 2011 was a banner year for you guys. So that's the goal, not only to be, be good in the city, but to make a name for yourself outside the city. Oh yeah, yep. The national championships, that, that was pretty awesome because there were teams from all over the country. And we're division two, um, but the, the step above us is division one. And then there's um, the Premier League and we got to play um, you know, we played the Division Two teams, but we got to see the Premier League and the Division One girls play from from Chicago and um, Texas and and California. We played against a team from California, and that was pretty awesome. And we really got our name out there nationally 
at, that year. But we also play in tournaments in Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, there is a tournament in Carbondale, Illinois that we play in every year. And so you we, go back home. I get to go back home, which is nice. Yeah, and my family always likes to come down and watch in that tournament too. You guys have a fall season. You have a spring season. You told everybody about when you play and when you practice. Uh, they're having fun out here. You see the smile on our face <laughs> throughout this interview. Cheryl, thank you so much. An absolute thank pleasure you. and continued success. And we hope this will give you some exposure because it's terrific what you guys are doing. That's awesome. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. The Tigers lost to Michigan State last Saturday and saw their basketball season end at 31 and 5. And while preseason expectations may have come up a bit short, Josh Pastor won his first NCAA tourney game as Memphis coach while also leading his team to a perfect 19 0 mark in their final season in Conference USA. And while nobody should be satisfied, nobody should be disappointed either. And with a top tier recruiting class coming in for next season, things may only get better. And that'll do it for this week. We'll see you next time.